Okay, I think we'll begin uh, this evening. Good evening, uh, and thank you for joining us today. Welcome to the uh, third lecture in the University of Regina's Deliberation and Debate Lecture Series. Um, our lecture this evening is entitled Carbon Pricing in Saskatchewan, uh, with a meaningful question mark at the end of that. Uh, it features Chris Reagan, Dale Eisler, and Margot Herbert, who are at the panel on my left. My name is Jeremy Rayner. I'm the director of the Johnson Shyama Graduate School of Public Policy, University of Saskatchewan campus, uh, and I'll be moderating tonight's session. Uh, JSGS is very pleased to uh, partner with the University of Regina in hosting this third lecture in the Deliberation and Debate Lecture Series. Uh, I will be um, uh, abbreviating Johnson Shyama Graduate School of Public Policy to JSGS wherever possible. Uh, it's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, at this time, I would like to acknowledge that this lecture is taking place on Treaty 4 land and the traditional home of the Métis. Uh, a little bit of background first before we get on with business. Uh, the Johnson Shyama School uh, is a provincial center for advanced study and research in public policy and, uh, and administration. We welcome any and all inquiries uh, from prospective students. Uh, the school is a product of a partnership between the University of Regina and the University of Saskatchewan. It's a genuinely provincial school. Um, we offer uh, courses at both campuses. <coughs> Students registered at one campus can take courses at the other. Uh, Saskatchewan is renowned for innovation, and JSGS, I think, is yet another example uh, of this with the combined expertise and resources of the two universities giving us a national profile. I'd now like to invite uh, Margot Hurlbert to the podium. Margot, who I'll introduce in a moment, is a member of the uh, Deliberation Debate Planning Committee, and she'll provide some background uh, on the series and bring greetings from, uh, uh, Professor, uh, from President Vianne Timmons. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, thank you for coming, everyone. I'd like to, uh, first of all, acknowledge uh, the University of Regina on Treaty 4 and Treaty 6 and the traditional home of the Métis. And on behalf of President Timmons, welcome everyone to the third Deliberation and Debate Lecture. Uh, special acknowledgments to Dr. Chris, Christopher Reagan here, our guest lecturer, and Dale Eisler, my colleague in the roundtable following the lecture. Uh, just a general background on the Deliberation and Debate Lecture series and how it came about. It came about because of uh, Dr. Timmons' uh, interest and concern about free speech and academic freedom here at the university and on other campuses. And because of that, she wanted to help incite open and frank debate, which is the hallmark of a university. Uh, but not lead a university where uh, it does not take place as president. So she worries about the whole idea of political correctness and that it might be stifling debate here in our universities. Uh, she also worries that debate and dialogue are becoming less civil in the world, uh, and Bill Walcott was an example and his history here on the University of Regina. So because of some of these concerns, she believes that everyone should have the opportunity to participate in respectful debate on sensitive and important topics. Uh, one quote from Jesse Jackson got her thinking, and it's that deliberation and debate is the way you stir the soul of our democracy. And that embodies everything that universities stand for. And it seemed like a great name for a lecture series. So her idea was to pilot this lecture series, uh, commit funds to support the discussion on important and difficult topics. And she formed a committee to assess suggestions from the university community. Individuals, departments forwarded uh, suggestions like the one here tonight. And uh, people have stepped up and really taken ownership of their lecture. So I am one of the committee members who has worked on this with President Timmons, Dr. Jack Bowen, who's a professor emeritus of economics and receiving an award at the Saskatchewan Museum tonight, Dr. James McNinch, the Faculty of Education, Dr. Andrew Stevens, Faculty of Business Administration, and Lisa Streifler, the Faculty of Media, Art, and Performance. Are any of those committee members here tonight? If you just want to stand and wave. No? I am. So how Dr. Reagan's lecture came about, uh, a former student, Dr. Brett Dolter uh, from Saskatchewan suggested him and the committee overwhelmingly agreed. The president's office has funded and the policy school here has done all the hard work or organizing. 
So future lectures to keep um, your eye open for is Caleb Ben, who will be speaking on environmental law and oil and gas production, Dr. Gad Saad, who's talking about freedom of speech, and Edward Snowden about illegal government surveillance. In closing, we want to see respectful, challenging discussions on our campus about issues that matter to all of us. I'll try and keep my lawyer in check. Uh, that has been our tradition and it must continue. Tonight is a great way to do that and I look forward to hearing from Dr. Reagan and Dale and participating, participating in this discussion. Thank you for attending and please enjoy the evening. Thank you, So uh, just then a, a, a few organizational details and uh, introductions and we can, uh, we can get going. So tonight's lecture will proceed as follows. First I'm going to welcome Chris Reagan to the podium to give his, his keynote presentation. It will be followed by uh, a discussion between our panel of experts uh, and Chris who will deliberate whether carbon pricing is a viable option for Saskatchewan and what it might look like. Uh, and finally, we will have a, a question and answer session with the audience. You can see we have a very large audience uh, here this evening uh, and that we are recording this uh, with cameras that face only to the, uh, the, the podium. So um, the, the procedure that we have uh, agreed on is that uh, we would ask you, please, if you have questions, to write them on an index card uh, and uh, I will read them to the, uh, the panel when the question and answer period comes. Uh, we have two members of staff from the JSGS uh, here tonight uh, who will be circulating around handing out these cards and, and, and pens. Trent and Connie, could we, uh, could we have a wave please at the back? If you want to, uh, yep, there we go. Um, there are also cards and, and pens uh, available at the registration desk as, as you came in. Um, so please, uh, um, that's the way to, uh, to ask a question uh, if you want one. Uh, some information then on tonight's speakers. Uh, Christopher Reagan is an associate professor in the Department of Economics at McGill University. He's chair of Canada's Ecofiscal Commission, uh, which launched in November 2014 with a five-year horizon to identify mm -hmm. policy options that would improve both environmental and economic performance in Canada. Um, we sometimes think of those two goals as in competition, but the Ecofiscal Commission is dedicated to uh, trying to demonstrate that they are in fact complementary. Uh, he's a research fellow at the C.D. Howe Institute. Uh, from 2010 to 2013, he held the Institute's David Dodge Chair in Monetary Policy and for many years was a member of the Monetary Policy Council. In 2009-10, he was the Clifford Clark Visiting Economist at uh, the Department of Finance. In 2004-05, he served as Special Advisor to the Governor of the Bank of Canada. Uh, his publications uh, focus mainly on the conduct of macroeconomic policy. Uh, and for many of you students in the audience, he will be instantly recognizable as the author of the textbook on economics, formerly co-authored with, with Richard Lipsy, which after 15 editions uh, is still the most widely used introductory economics textbook in Canada. He has a regular column in the Globe and Mail and teaches regularly for McKinsey and Company in its internal MBA <coughs> program. Uh, he teaches in EDHEC's Global MBA program in France, and in 2007, he was awarded the Noel F Fieldhouse Teaching Prize at McGill University. Christopher Reagan received his BA Honours in Economics in 1984 from the University of Victoria, his MA from Queen's University in 1985, and he moved to Cambridge, Massachusetts, where he received his PhD in Economics at MIT. Uh, Margot Herbert uh, on our panel has a BA uh, admin with great distinction from the University of Regina, an LLB and an LLM from Osgood Hall in Toronto in Constitutional Law, and a PhD from the University of Amsterdam in Social and Behavioral Sciences with a focus on adaptive governance and climate change. Uh, she is a practicing lawyer uh, who, prior to embarking on a full-time academic career, practiced law in private practice for 12 years and in corporate practice as Assistant General Counsel for Sachs Power for seven years. Dale Eisler, sitting immediately on my left, is a senior policy fellow at the Johnson Shyama School uh, and senior advisor on government relations to the University of Regina President Vianne Timmons. Before joining the U of R in the fall of 2013, he spent 16 years with the Government of Canada, including as, uh, as Assistant Deputy Minister for Energy Security with Natural Resources Canada. He also served as Consul General for Canada in Denver, Colorado. In 2013, 
he received the Government of Canada's Joan Atkinson Award for Public Service Excellence. Prior to joining the federal uh, government, he spent 25 years as a journalist. The author of three books, he has a degree in political science from the University of Regina and an MA in political studies from Vermont College. So a very, very distinguished panel this evening uh, and an especially distinguished guest whom I welcome to the podium, uh, Chris Reagan. Please join me in welcome. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Very nice introduction. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for coming from wherever you came from. Um, apparently the cold does not keep you away. So this is good. I was born and raised in Edmonton, so I know what a real winter day is about. Uh, I've kind of lost my part of my ability to handle winter because I'm in Montreal where we don't have fully real winters. But it was nice to get back to, uh, to the West. Um, I didn't know the quote from Jesse Jackson about deliberation and debate, but it's a wonderful quote. And my hat is off, I don't usually wear a hat, but my hat is off to President Timmons for creating, or for, for having this, this idea of creating a lecture series of this kind. I, I share the concern that there's not, it is not often enough the case that we, that even universities, which should be um, always the home of debate and free speech uh, and to discuss difficult concepts, difficult ideas. It's not often enough that we actually do it. And so it's very important that we do it. And frankly, I think you will, you will be hard pressed to find a topic that is as contentious <laughs> and as complex as climate policy. And so that's where I will start. Um, I am not going to show you any geeky economist graphs tonight. I often do that, uh, but instead I will just give you geeky economist words to complement non-geeky and typically non-economist slides. Um, climate policy is contentious and it is complex. Um, and I think general principles can take you a long way but I think it's also very important that when you are thinking about policy and designing policy, that you think about the very important details within the jurisdiction. And the Saskatchewan economy is a different beast than the BC economy, and it's different, they're both different than the Quebec economy. You've got a very different economic structure, you've got a very different energy mix, you've got a different emissions profile. And I think we've got to think about when we think about carbon pricing, we can't just think about generalities. We've got to apply those ideas to the details on the ground. Um, so because climate policy and, and climate change is largely about the combustion of fossil fuels, I'd like to start my comments with talking about fossil fuels. Um, and frankly, to recognize how remarkable fossil fuels are. Um, not just for the world, right, but for the Saskatchewan economy. So you think about fossil fuels. Why, why do I think that fossil fuels are so remarkable? Well, you've got this little package of stuff that is produced from hundreds of millions of years of the warmth of the sun and the weight of the Earth's crust and it is concentrating, working on organic matter, and concentrating a tremendous amount of energy into a very small, very dense, very mobile little package. That energy density is, makes, makes fossil fuels, whether you're talking about coal or natural gas or oil, that energy density and the convenience and the mobility um, explain why fossil fuels have taken over the world as an energy source. I mean, almost nothing beats fossil fuels uh, for, again, as I said, for their mobility, their convenience. It has completely transformed or built modern economies and transformed uh, various forms of transportation. And its energy efficiency and its convenience and its mobility lies behind its economic value. That economic value, of course, is very important to the Saskatchewan economy. So 29,000 wells producing something like 500,000 barrels a day, bringing in over $8 billion a year to the Saskatchewan economy. 
Very, very important. And back to the energy density, nothing beats it. Renewables don't beat it. Uh, hydropower doesn't beat it. Uh, solar power doesn't beat it yet. Wind power doesn't beat it. The only thing that comes close right now with today's technology and today's market prices, the only thing that really comes close, and it comes close because of a, of a very similar energy density, is nuclear power. So it's very similar. Uranium has got this energy density that's much like fossil fuels. And it, it is also common to Saskatchewan. 9,300 tons produced every year, worth $1.2 billion to the Saskatchewan economy. So remarkable resources. But there's a downside. And the downside for uranium and for nuclear power, the downside has been well understood around the world for decades. We have known, and we probably had to learn the hard way, but we have known that proximity and contact with uh, spent nuclear fuel uh, creates some serious problems, can kill people. Um, and so we've dealt with that, and I'll come back to that in a second. The downside to fossil fuels, well, there's a bunch of downsides. There are gas leaks. There are oil spills into water or on land. There are air particulates from burning coal. All of those are very important downsides from the burning of fossil fuels. But the other one, then the one that we're really talking about here tonight, is, you know, 50 years ago we didn't really know this, but over the past 20 or 30 years, scientists from around the world have concluded that the burning of fossil fuels really is important in terms of creating greenhouse gases that get trapped in the atmosphere, they're there for decades, and they contribute to global climate change. And um, so we need to think about these downsides. So remarkable resources on the one hand, and we need to recognize how wonderful they are, but downsides that are pretty important. And this to me suggests that we need to bring human ingenuity into the mix. So think about, think about what we did, what we kind of as a global society did when we thought about the downsides from uranium and nuclear power. What we didn't do was say, well, um, there's a problem with using uranium, therefore we'll stop using it. We didn't do that. What we did, and different countries of course made different decisions, but globally there's a tremendous amount of nuclear power that is used to produce ele electricity. The response was actually to throw our human ingenuity to the problem. We said, this is too good a resource to not use, so we're going to use uranium to generate electricity. Unfortunately, we use some uranium to do some other bad things. I won't talk about those. But we use uranium to generate electricity and then through very costly handling and transportation and storage, we deal with the downsides. Now, the nuclear industry around the world has not been perfect, for sure. But it is hard to believe, hard to argue, I think, that it hasn't been a considerable success. So now think about the downsides of fossil fuels. It has always struck me as bizarre to hear voices that say we need to end oil and that we need to stop pipeline projects, gas or oil, and we need to close down Alberta's oil sands. Those voices are talking about ending oil or ending fossil fuels because of the downsides. In my view, that is, it's almost a reckless position and it's to be, I think, quite cavalier about the tremendous wealth source that fossil fuels bring. It, to me, it means it makes far more sense to actually use our human ingenuity to say, how can we continue to produce fossil fuels and to sell them to those people who want to buy them and to use them as long as they continue to be economical and super energy efficient, as long as they win in the marketplace and they do better than those energy sources, why don't we keep using them? But why don't we use our human ingenuity to deal with the downside? And I think that's the challenge. How do we actually use our ingenuity to deal with the downside? Now this is not a simple problem and nor is it a problem just in Saskatchewan or just in Western Canada or just in Canada. This is a truly global problem. 
every ton of emissions that comes out of a facility in Moose Jaw rises and joins in the atmosphere emissions that come from Montreal and Milan and Mumbai, just to pick the M cities. And they're all the same. They all contribute to the same problem. And what this means is we've got a global collective action problem, is that it makes no sense for just Moose Jaw or just Montreal or just Milan or just Mumbai to deal with this it, unless we're all dealing with this. And that's the problem with a global collective action problem. It's the collective part that makes it really difficult. Because any one city or region or country might think about, well, why don't we free ride on the efforts of others? Why don't we let others do the work? And then we don't have to bear the burden, whatever burden is involved. And the problem is, if everybody thinks that way, nobody does anything, and then the problem doesn't get solved. Now, I don't think Canadians see themselves as free riders. I don't think Canadians want to be free riders. I don't think we want to do nothing to solve the global problem while others are doing it. But we have to figure out how to engage internationally and convince other countries to pull their weight. But it's hard to do that with, with a straight face, with credibility, unless we back home are doing something for us. So, and I think that's why you see now that Canadian provinces, a majority of <coughs> Canadian provinces, are now building these policies. They've either implemented these policies or they're in the process of designing these policies. And a federal government is now, you know, actively engaged and, I guess, coordinating what's going on. So this brings me, let's suppose you agree, just suppose we agree that there's a need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. That's actually where the Ecofiscal Commission started. We don't question the science because we are not placed to question the science. I think scientists should question the science. I really think they should continue questioning and debating the science. But we are mere economists. And so we take the overwhelming consensus that exists among the global scientific community and we say, all right, if the scientists say that there is global um, climate change and it's coming from the burning of fossil fuels uh, and there is a need to reduce these, then we're going to focus on the next question, which is where we can really add value as economists. And that's what policy are you going to choose to do it? And here I want to say that I am not indifferent about which policy we choose. And, but my, in, my lack of indifference comes from a clear professional bias. And I just want to be very clear about what my professional bias is. I am an economist. So what, that means I'm not a normal person. Okay, for, first and foremost, right? Normal people do not think like economists. It's just, it's very clear. And it, you may not run into very many economists, so you may have not have experienced this, but I run into many normal people. I teach many normal people, and when I'm through with them, they are no longer normal. <laughs> but I encounter many, many normal people, and economists think differently. Now, one of the things, though, that we think is really important, and I would say this is a defining characteristic of the Ecofiscal Commission, is that we're not just looking for ways to reduce emissions or to reduce other pollution. We're not just about carbon. We think it's equally important to reduce emissions in the way that is absolutely the best for the economy. We think to not do both of them is to miss the boat. We live in a world right now in Saskatchewan and in every part of this country that is suffering from low economic growth. Part of that is kind of the natural, the remnants of the global financial crisis. Some of it is other things. But we live in a world of low growth, and I think it is inappropriate, frankly, to not think about the best economic way to achieve our environmental objectives. So that's a defining feature. So we're going to look for the way, and I'm going to push the way and advocate the way to reduce emissions that is the lowest cost way. Well, what are our options? Option number one looks like this. They are regulations. The governments design regulations, often sector by sector, but regulations typically stipulate who has to do what, when, and how. So the steel industry should reduce emissions by this amount over this time frame using this technology. 
Vehicles need to adopt this technology over the following time frame to reduce emissions by that amount. Quite intrusive. What is the pr now, regulations of this kind can be effective. Regulations can be effective in the following sense. They can actually achieve their environmental objectives. But they've got some other problems. One problem is that they require a tremendous amount of information. If governments are going to des design intrusive or prescriptive is a better word, regulations that apply to firms in different firms, different industries, they have to understand the technologies being used in different firms and in different industries. They have to understand very often things that firms are unable to write down because sometimes firms are figuring it out for themselves. So it makes designing regulations very tough. And a second point which is related to that is that regulations are often very costly. Because you are telling people what to do, you're, you're generally telling people what to do and how to do it rather than letting them figure out the lowest cost way to do things. And the other problem with regulations is that it's not great for innovation. If you are a regulated ent entity, you kind of do what you are told to do, you comply with the regulation, or there's a penalty, and then you stop. What you don't do is constantly try to get better because the regulation doesn't require you to constantly get better. So those are problems with regulations. And if you want to know, you know, economists are quite often accused, probably of many things, but one of the things we're quite often accused of is not agreeing. Most economists agree that regulations are far more costly to the economy than other methods. And I'll give you a number for that in a couple of minutes. Approach number two. Invest in technology. This is a great idea. So there's a lot said in Saskatchewan about using our human ingenuity to develop technology called carbon capture and storage. This is a wonderful idea. If we can capture the emissions from a coal-fired electricity plant or, frankly, from other kind of large sources, if you can capture the emissions and store them safely, whether it's stored in a tank or stored in a natural reservoir, or use it for an enhanced oil recovery, and all of this is going on now, the enhanced oil recovery and the capture is going on Boundary Dam in Estevan. If you can do this, and it can be scalable, and it can be economical, we can change the world. Because if you could really do this, and you could replicate this technology <coughs> all over the place, we could keep burning remarkable fossil fuels, and we could eliminate the downside. Now that is a game changer. So I think, and you know, I, I, I applaud, frankly, the Saskatchewan government, with I think a little bit of help from the federal government, in investing in this technology. Because if it works out, it's pretty great. The problem is it is expensive, and it is risky. So I actually think that while investments in carbon capture and storage are a good idea, I'm not sure I would want to put all of my policy eggs in that basket. What if it doesn't work out? What if you're not able to export this technology to the rest of the world because somebody else beats you to it? Possible. So I would say, let's keep doing this, but could we supplement this with option number three, which you haven't heard yet, but I bet you you can guess it. Option number three reminds me of Adam Smith. This is Adam Smith. This is a statue of Adam Smith in High Street in uh, Edinburgh. And Adam Smith was a leading member of the Scottish Enlightenment. He wrote The Wealth of Nations in 1776. He was the first person to kind of think about what prices do. And he wasn't thinking about it like a consumer or like a producer. He was thinking about it as a device for social organization. And he is uh, rightly, I think, attributed or uh, considered the father of modern economics. Well, the whole point of a carbon price is to actually use these market forces. A carbon price puts a, you know, you can do it with a tax or you can do it with a more complex cap and trade system like Ontario is using. I would choose the tax. Um, but you could put a simple tax that puts a price on carbon emissions. And everybody, households, Individuals, families, small businesses, large businesses would all face a carbon price and that would give them a clear incentive to do less of whatever they're currently doing that produces those emissions. Or to just do it 
differently. So firms will continue to produce the goods and services they're doing, but they'll come up with ways to do it that uses different energy sources, or that packages differently, or requires less transportation. Transportation companies will come up with different ways to design their transportation. I was in CN's boardroom 10 days ago, and they gave me a list of 10 ways that they could improve fuel efficiency and reduce emissions per ton kilometer traveled. 10 different ways, and they hadn't figured them all out yet. But I put a, put a carbon price in place, and they then figure out which way is the best way. A carbon price, because it's based on market forces, says we don't need the information about all the firms and all the sectors. The government puts a carbon price in place, and then they say, you figure it out. So we're all going to respond differently to a carbon price. Some people are going to say, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to have a car. I'm going to take public transit. Some people will say that. Some people will say, nope, I like my car. I'm going to keep my car, but I'll just drive a little bit less. Some people will say, nope, I'm going to keep my car. I like my car, but I'm going to turn the heat down in my house. That's my wife's favorite approach. <laughs> so I come home at the end of the day. She's wearing three fleeces and I go, oh man, it's cold tonight. But, you know, she, she just turns that heat down so people are going to get more, uh, more efficient thermostats. Some people will ha have different travel arrangements. Producers will come up with different ways. None of this happens quickly. And this is one of the problems with carbon pricing. Some advocates of carbon pricing say, we want to reduce emissions dramatically right away. Let's have a ca carbon price. And the critics then say, well, hold on. People aren't going to respond right away. People are still going to drive to work. People are still going to do this, do that. Nobody should be advocating carbon pricing as a quick fix to this problem. But this isn't a problem that needs a quick fix. We should not be thinking about policy here for a year or for an electoral cycle. This isn't a problem that over that span of time. This is a problem over 40, 50, 60 years, we should be thinking about designing a policy to reduce emissions gradually over 40, 50, 60 years. If you do a bit every year, you get to a big amount after 50 years. Business competitiveness is a really key issue. Really key issue. It's a key issue in this province. It's a key issue, frankly, in any province. But it is a keyer issue. That can't possibly be a word. It's a bigger issue in this province. So the issue here is what happens if you put a carbon price in place and firms that are particularly carbon intensive, they see their costs go up. You're a cement maker. You're a fertilizer maker. You're a steel mill in Regina that we've been hearing about. We've been hearing about this in the news because will they be producing the pipe that gets used in the Keystone XL that President Trump just approved? Or Will President Trump say, sorry, the steel has to be made in the United States? Um, if you're in the oil patch, you're emissions intensive. If you're a refinery, you're emissions intensive. There's different amounts of emissions intensity. But the competitiveness issue here is what happens if your costs go up, but some competing jurisdiction against which you are competing um, doesn't have a carbon price? So the carbon price in this jurisdiction is now tilting the playing field in an unhelpful way and disadvantaging our firms. Now here's what we don't want to happen. What we do not want with a well-designed carbon price is to reduce emissions in Saskatchewan, but the reason why you reduce them is because your Saskatchewan business closes up and moves across the border into North Dakota or Montana or Alberta or Manitoba. Um, and then we bear the economic cost of them shutting down, and the, lack, the, the lack of jobs, but emissions just pop up across the border. I mean, that would just be a really bad policy because we would bear the economic costs and there would be zero global environmental benefit. So we've got to design a policy to prevent that problem. And I would be the first to say that if carbon pricing meant absolutely that you had this problem and you couldn't solve it, I would say, don't do it. Fortunately, I'm not going to say that because you can actually solve this problem. But before I tell you how to solve it, just talk about two sectors in this province that are important. One is oil and gas. So some people say, well, is oil and gas in that problem? I mean, you can't move an oil well from southern Saskatchewan 
to North Dakota because we have a carbon price here and they don't have a carbon price there. You can't pick up the oil well and move it. If you're going to develop the oil in Saskatchewan, it's got to be where you find the oil, which is in Saskatchewan. That's true. But there's still a competitiveness issue here because the financial capital that builds that well and finances those operations is highly mobile. So you all know about the Bakken Formation, which straddles uh, uh, western North Dakota and eastern Montana and southern Saskatchewan. And there's a bunch of firms who are drilling wells in all three of those jurisdictions, all in the Bakken Formation. And if we put a carbon price in Saskatchewan and they don't down there, some firm could very easily say, well, okay, my costs are higher in Saskatchewan. They're not higher in North Dakota. I'll close down the well in Saskatchewan. I'm going to open up one, drill a few more in North Dakota, and we then bear the economic costs of that dislocation. This is a problem in this sector. So I better have a solution for it. And then there's this. Agriculture is bigger, bigger than oil in this economy, way bigger. Um, it's less emissions intensive, but it's still got some emissions. You've got to worry about this. And most agricultural producers are selling into international markets, like the oil producers, where um, they can't pass the higher costs on to consumers in the form of higher prices because they're selling into international markets where the price is, is set by world forces. So if you're going to drive up their costs for fuel or costs for fertilizer or costs for transport, it's going to hurt. So you don't want this to be a problem. You don't want to close down your agricultural sector, for sure, okay, um, if this is going to happen with a carbon price. So I better be able to solve this problem too. <clears throat> One-sixth of Saskatchewan's greenhouse gas emissions come from agriculture. So what's the solution? Because um, there is a solution. I absolutely believe, and we have written reports on this, and we've talked to, to other policymakers in other provinces about how to do these policies. And the secret, not surprisingly, is multicolored. It's got those colors. The secret is money, as is so often the case. I'm an economist, so I have to say things like this. The secret is money. So the secret, or I shouldn't say it's a secret or a trick, but the key to understanding how to deal with the competitiveness issue, whether it's in the oil patch or the cement sector or agriculture, is to say, well, look, we've got two problems and we need two tools to solve it. Number one problem is you've got to reduce emissions. What's the best way to do that? A carbon price. What's the second problem? We've got to prevent our firms from leaving because of their higher costs. How do we prevent them from leaving? Well, let's give them some of the cash back. But we don't give them, back, give them back cash as a function of their emissions. We give them back cash as a function of their remaining in the jurisdiction, remaining in production, remaining hiring your workers. So you could actually give them an output-based subsidy. You could give them cash in a brown envelope if you want. Okay, I would not recommend that. Okay, but you, know, you want to make this kind of rules-based and transparent. But you're, you're making them pay the carbon price so they face that price incentive to reduce emissions. But you're giving them cash back that is only then is conditional on their remaining in production in your jurisdictions. Two problems, two tools, you can do this. And you have to do it carefully. Right? This is not something you do on the back of a napkin. Okay? It's something you do on a full sheet of paper. Full sheet of paper. Okay, you gotta, you gotta work out the details. One final thought and then I'm gonna sit down. One final thought. What is my final thought here? There is nothing, nothing, nothing in theory or in real world evidence that says we need bigger government to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. You do not need bigger government. You just don't. Why couldn't we have a carbon price, for all the reasons that I've suggested here, make it designed very, very carefully, but return every penny, every penny, to the people. You could put it, give it back to households, you could give it to low-income households, you could give it to all households. You could give it back to small business, you could give it to the emissions intensive sector. You could give it in the form of income tax cuts, you could give it in the form of targeted rebates. You could choose a mixture 
of that. But you could give every penny back to the economy. Every penny. Government would not be one penny bigger, but it would be raising its revenue in different ways. Government would be raising its revenue, or a big chunk of its revenue, by taxing carbon, which is something we all agree, I think, we want less of. And it would be raising less of its revenue by taxing the things that I think we all agree we kind of want more of. Income, profits, innovation, jobs. Put up your hand if you don't want more of that. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> Nobody. So um, that's the idea. Wouldn't you like to pay less? Now, fiscal conservatives, small c conservatives, <laughs> ought to prefer a world where the government is taxing pollution rather than taxing income. So this morning, when I woke up, I did what like most economists would do when they're in Regina in a hotel room early in the morning. I went to the web page of the Saskatchewan government, looked up the Saskatchewan budget, and figured out how much the Saskatchewan budget makes this year in taxes of various kinds. And the answer is $7 billion, give or take. $7 billion. And then I said, hmm, what would happen, just suppose, if the Saskatchewan government it, uh, reduced its emissions, or Saskatchewan province reduced its emissions by 30% by 2030, and it took about a $150 carbon price to get there. That's, by the way, um, 35 cents a liter gasoline. And the answer was, you could eliminate all taxes in the province. Eliminate them. Eliminate personal income tax. Eliminate corporate income tax. Eliminate your sales tax. It's not so bad. So when people say to me, we can't have a carbon price that high, my answer is, why can't we have income taxes that low? And I'll stop there. If you'd like to know what this photograph is, this is a nice tent on the side of a nice lake beside nice mountains, and I have no idea where it is. <laughs> it's in Google land. But it captured for me perfectly the image of what it feels like to be a person speaking about carbon pricing. It's lonely. <laughs> it's lonely, but this is a special mountain equipment co-op infinitely expandable tent. So when you start thinking about carbon pricing and you want to tell kind of, you know, round the campfire ghost stories about carbon pricing, come on down. Hot chocolate is always on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, before we turn to uh, our question and answer session, and I would like to point out to our staffers here, I've received no cards as, as yet. Um, uh, I'd like to call on the, the panel who have, I hope, a couple of difficult questions uh, for Chris to answer. Um, when we get those question and answer, I guess we'll have the, the, the proof that uh, whether uh, Chris has uh, confirmed his thesis that economists aren't actually like ordinary people, or whether he's proved uh, decisive evidence that, uh, in fact, they are. So I look forward to that. Margot, could I call on you? Sure. Thank you for that. Uh, can you get this on? Thank you for that presentation, uh, Dr. Reagan. That was very, very, very interesting. And I think we actually were sitting here in our tent with our hot chocolate uh, in agreement in, in many, many things, uh, most importantly, needing to address climate change and the problem of carbon and uh, the global collective action problem that it is. And I think, f personally, for me and, and the concerns I see from a policy perspective is choosing one policy instrument here, a carbon tax or a cap and trade, and not considering um, 
other policy instruments that also might be available. To mention a few, uh, financial <coughs> instruments such as accelerated depreciation on uh, making changes to infrastructure in order to reduce carbon, uh, providing direct funding to incent uh, electricity sectors, uh, the SAS Power here making changes such as CCS, uh, internationally traded mitigation options or outcomes where we actually take some of our technology internationally uh, like carbon capture sequestration and receive credit for reducing the carbon in the countries that we know that are expanding uh, coal production. Every second day a coal generation unit is opened up in China and India and of course now our problem is the United States uh, perhaps is becoming part of that free ride that you're suggesting. So I, I worry that simply choosing one instrument, a carbon tax, to the exclusion of other options, um, as you said, is not a quick fix, and perhaps it's too long term. Uh, having a $30 carbon price is going to move our electricity sector into natural gas. But our, our electricity sector has been doing that now since 1994. So this isn't, this isn't something new that's happening. So the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, is very clear in its 2014 report that in order to address climate change and keep our global warming uh, to two degrees Celsius, we need to act quickly or we will have very large costs. And in all of the models that these, these scientists are running in order to address climate change, carbon capture and sequestration is a very large component, as well as renewable technologies, uh, bioenergy CCS, uh, small nuclears, and a host of new technologies in the electricity se sector, in addition to electrifying our cars and our vehicles so that we're no longer burning gas. So if, my question is, if we achieve our, our Paris commitments and keep our global warming to two degrees, which is slightly different, I know, what kind of carbon price are we looking at? And if at that carbon price, what does our world look like and doesn't it make more sense to envision what that world is going to look like and consider some more direct means of achieving that goal uh, over the next uh, 20 or 30 years to hit our 2030 and our 2050 commitments? Small question. <laughs> Do you need a mic? <laughs> OK, so great question. Um, so let me, let me just say right at the outset that I do not believe that a carbon price is all that you need. But I do believe that a carbon price is, um, can be relied on to do an enormous amount of the work. Um, and the reason is that a lot, so it's, 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 it's interesting to think about what the economy will look like 50 years from now and 75 years from now. And if the question includes, what does our economy look like 50 years from now and 75 years from now? My answer is, yeah, pretty much I don't have a clue, okay? Uh, except this, I'm pretty sure it will be lower carbon. I'm pretty sure about that. Now, we might still be burning the oil, but we won't, or the oil and, and coal, but we won't be releasing it. Or we will be using energy sources, that, some of which you can imagine, or we will be using energy sources that none of us can yet imagine. And I think Probably there's some of all of those going on. I, I think we are particularly bad as humans at actually figuring out what the future looks like. Uh, and I think as policymakers, it is a dangerous thing to try to plan. But the interesting thing about a carbon price, and especially a carbon price that rises over time, and I'll get to that, which is an important part of your question, is that that carbon price will drive those changes. A carbon price drives innovation, not just in, it doesn't just drive the kind of the mundane decisions about how I heat my house. It is going to create a business, uh, it's going to energize a business model for anything that is low carbon. If you speak to clean tech venture capitalists and you say, what's the number one way to energize your business model? They'd say, put a carbon price in place. Because that carbon price 
increases the demand for low carbon everything. And it just, it just drives that, it drives that kind of sectoral expansion. So I think, I think there's going to be a lot of different things in place in the next 75 years. Some of them will happen as a result of the carbon price and the incentives. But I do think there's a need for other things. So here's where there is an interesting debate among economists and climate people, which is some people will say, well, if you put a carbon price in place, then you just kind of wash your hands with the rest and the market will take care of the rest. And some people would then say, well, that will get you in the direction that we want to go, but it may not get us the reductions that we need in the time scale that we need them. Basically, because we can't ramp up those alternative technologies, we can't develop those alternative technologies in the scale that we need them as fast as we need them. And therefore, they conclude, we need to have government direct involvement in some of this. And I, you know, I'm not quite sure where I am on that debate, frankly. Um, but I do think that government needs to be careful about making those investments, because I think government is not great at making those investments all the time. Sometimes they are. So um, two final bits. Where does the price need to go? And, and then I'll use an opportunity to, to pitch our next report. Um, the question, where does the price need to go to get to you know, big reductions so that we achieve our Paris commitments? I, the honest answer is I don't know. Almost certainly higher than zero. Almost certainly higher than $50 per ton. Um, if you look at modeling exercises, there are some people that say it's $150 per ton in Canada. Some people will say it's $200. $150 per ton, by the way, is uh, $150 per ton is 35 cents per liter. So that may sound like a lot, but just think if at the same time you had no income taxes, that might not be so bad. That might not be so bad. Um, so I think you're kind of in the $150 to $200 range uh, in Canada for achieving the 2030 commitments in that ballpark. Mm -hmm. Final bit is if you're going to think about other policies to complement your carbon price, and I think governments are doing this and should do this, you won't be surprised that Ecofiscal would have an opinion on the kinds of policies that would be good complements and the kinds that would be bad. And our um, key idea here is cost effectiveness. So our report that's coming out in April or May will be exactly on this point. It's aimed at governments that you know, either have a carbon price in place or will soon have a carbon price in place. And then we say, OK, now a carbon price will do a huge amount of work, but it won't do everything. There are some sectors that you, it's kind of hard to price. So you're going to want to have some complementary policies around the edges. But let's make sure those complementary policies aren't really expensive. Back to this idea that if we're going to put high cost policies in place, it's going to be bad for the economy. And if we have lower cost alternatives, why would you not choose a lower cost alternative? So I'll just end with that. So, so keep a lookout for our next major report. We do not have a sexy title chosen yet, but I am open to suggestions. Thank you, Chris. I just I'd like to ask Dale to uh, okay. try a difficult question. Thank you. Uh, Thanks, uh, Chris. That was, it was fascinating. And you, you expressed a professional bias when you were speaking. I'm going to express a personal bias right now, and that is I am a profound pessimist on the issue of climate change and our ability to get to the targets that we, we, we talk about. Uh, and I, uh, uh, your slide, I think it was slide five, which is about the collective action problem, and this is, this is not simple, this is complex, and it's global. I absolutely agree, yeah. and I sort of don't get past that. That's kind of where I'm at on this, okay? Um, and and I'm, I'm pessimistic and I think I'm a realist on this for basically three reasons. The first is, as you said, it's a global challenge. And I'm, it, you, it's hard to imagine a more complex public policy and political issue than, than this one. Uh, and it requires uh, international collaboration and cooperation like we've never seen before. And we all know that nations act in their own self-interest. That's always been the case. Uh, so. Uh, uh, and I think a, a perfect example of that actually was COP21 in Paris in December of 2015, where we had 195 nations, I believe, uh, sign on to the the agreement of holding the temperature increase to two, two, two degrees or less, or less uh, by 20, 195 countries, uh, non-binding, 
no compliance mechanisms, right? So there's no way of enforcing this, so everybody happily signs on, to address a problem that is uh, decades out into the future by governments that all have different interests, needs, and issues that they face. An, un an unbelievable array of issues, differing issues for each of these nations out there. Uh, that's reason number one I'm a pessimist. Number two is, this issue, like it or not, pits the developed rich nations against poor underdeveloped nations. Fundamentally, that's what this is. And it's even, it, it, it's as much as uh, admitted uh, by the United Nations in their, in, with their Millennial Development Goals, which they announced for 2016, 17 uh, sustainable, sustainable Development Goals. Of the 17, climate change is 13th on the list. 13th, right? And why is that? I don't know, but I assume it's because the other ones that they list ahead of it, like eradicating poverty, uh, uh, edu educating people, uh, clean water for people, issues that are taking lives and impacting human beings today are urgent and pressing, and climate change is way down the list. So how do we get this collective action that you talk about? And third, uh, by its nature, it defies the natural cycles of government because governments operate on short ter shorter to medium term horizons because of the reality of politics and that's just the nature of governance. So we're, ch we're talking about issues that are decades out into the future and we're expecting global collective action, coordinated economic, fiscal and environmental policy by 200 nations around the world to achieve this goal. I can't believe that will happen. And just as a, maybe a fourth throw in, <laughs> Donald Trump, <laughs> who's now president of the biggest, of the United States with the biggest economy in the world, who is reversing the U.S. position on climate change and reneging on COP21. And that's just an example of the cycles of politics and how it's impossible, it's impossible for us to seriously think about this in a global context. So while I believe that carbon pricing is the right way to go, I, I can't imagine how we're going to get there. Uh, and I mean, the, the government of Canada is talking about a $10, uh, uh, carbon, $10 ton carbon price next year, which is meaningless. And, it's, and it faces significant opposition yeah. in this province, in Alberta as well, I know. Uh, and the reason the price isn't higher, because of the political implications of a higher price. Mark Jackard at, at Simon Fraser University, who I'm sure you know, he says it, it's $200 a ton is the price that we need to actually achieve our, our, our climate goals. Governments aren't going to go anywhere near that. We're talking about a $50 a ton price, maybe, by 2022, if the federal government goes forward. And the reason it's that slow is because politically it's not tenable. And we have to accept that reality. And so while I agree with the, with the conversation and the debate about carbon pricing, and I think it is, it is an instrument, an important instrument, but we need to do many, as, as Margot said, I am stymied by the... Uh, what I think is the, the real politic of this, which I can't imagine us resolving. So, so that wasn't a question, but can well, I just, I, I can, I, can I, <laughs> well, can I, guess I my, my question. Can, can I respond anyway? Yeah, please do. Okay, please do. so I agreed with much of what Dale said, but fortunately I didn't agree with everything. But it is absolutely a global collective action problem, and it is a wickedly difficult uh, global collective action problem. We agree on that. It is a north versus south or developed versus developing challenge uh, and that adds another layer, a major layer of complication. I completely accept that point. It does defy the cycle of government. I completely agree with that point. So he said two things though that I disagree with vehemently. Number one, he said the problems are in the distant future. This is not like social security reform. I never said that. No, no, I know. I'm, but I, I'm just throwing that in there. So if you were in the United States right now and you were thinking about Social Security reform, you would be saying, well, that's a distant problem. Because at some point, 50 years down the road, and it's sooner than that, they're going to run out of money. But that's a problem over there. Now, climate change is a problem 50 years down the road. But it's also a problem now. So in our report called The Way Forward, which is our first carbon pricing report. By the way, if you go to ecofiscal.ca, everything that we have ever published, French and English, is right there. Blogs, essays, op-eds, and our reports. The way forward, we, um, we felt it was really necessary to talk about, to kind of address this issue, that it isn't this intangible, distant problem only. 
It is also a, a future problem, but it's also a present problem. So whether you're talking about the decline in the economic value of the Western Canadian forests because of the mountain pine beetle, they don't die in the winter anymore because the winters are too warm. So you wiped out a huge amount of economic value of the Western Canadian forests. Or the decline in the, in the economic value of the mollusk fisheries in Atlantic Canada. Or greater uh, transport costs through the St. Lawrence Seaway and the Great Lakes because of lower water levels. And so that raises costs. Or greater transportation costs up to the northern diamond mines because you can't take the winter roads for as long anymore because winter doesn't last as long anymore. So you've got to do more expensive um, freight travel by air. There's a whole bunch of examples like this in Canada across the country that are tangible that are happening right now. And if you ever really want somebody to be passionate about this, if I'm not passionate enough about it, get to know a property insurer. A property insurer. And say, hey, how's your life these days with climate change? Because when there's you know, the flood in Calgary, or the fires in Fort McMurray, or other things, no one of these events is caused by climate change. But clim part of climate change is a greater frequency of extreme weather events. And those extreme weather events hurt. So I think there are costs today that we need to worry about. The second thing I disagreed with is that a high carbon price is politically unacceptable. I completely reject that. And the reason I reject that 